Gracious and eternal God, we do thank you, Lord, for the wondrous privilege of being able to gather together this morning to study your word. We ask and pray, Lord, that in your grace and your power that you speak into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Lord, glorify your name. We commit all things to you, Lord, for Jesus' sake. And God's people say, Amen. Twenty-five years ago now, a book appeared entitled The Best and the Brightest. The Best and the Brightest. And it hit the bestseller lists. It was about the, the sharpest and brightest advisors to the American president, J.F. Kennedy. And the book spoke about their wise insights, their innovative thoughts on how they went and rocked the world for American policy. They were said to be phenomenally wise. Their political insights were said to be incredible. So much so that this book was written about them. And they were held up before the, law, the world and before governments as people to take note of. But you know what? They've been forgotten. Who here remembers the political advisors to J.F. Kennedy? Can you name them? Can anyone here sit back and name what they went and did? Their policies? Their insights? No one. And when, and when were they giving advice to the world? Well, 1960. 60 years ago. No one remembers them. And no one cares. Let's be honest. If I stood up now and I said to you, I know the political advisors to J.F. Kennedy, you would look at me and say, well, that's just great. That, that's lovely. That's good for you. We're happy. No one cares. No one's interested. But when you look back in history, 2,600 years ago, we find another group who are called the wisest, the best, and the brightest. And not only were they seen that way by one of the world's greatest leaders at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled one of the greatest world empires ever known, but there are countless men and women and young people in our world today, 2020, who know at least one of their names, if not all of their names. Just as you do. Just as you do. In fact, they have been inscribed in our hearts and our memories by God. And do you know why? Well, because God will not let them be forgotten because they were uncompromising people. God will not let their names disappear into history. You say, who are they? Well, turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1, and here they are. And who hasn't heard the name Daniel? I'm sure you all have. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, reading from verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put into the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defects, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among them were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Meshach, Meshach. To Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now what are we reading about here? What are we reading about? Well in 606 BC, what happened is that the Babylonian army, which today we would call the Iraqi army at that time, invaded what was called the Southern Jewish Kingdom. And the tiny Jewish state went and collapsed under the onslaught. There were 10 Jewish tribes to the north in the northern kingdom, and there were Jewish tribes to the south, only two. The northern tribes were wiped out by the Assyrians, and the two southern Jewish states were later hit by the Babylonians. As thousands of Babylonian soldiers poured across the Jewish frontiers, uh, supported by fast-moving chariots, in one of the most powerful armed invasions 
of the ancient world. Within days, the capital of Jerusalem had been completely surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's forces. It was absolutely terrifying. It was dramatic. The people were absolutely shocked and terrified. And it wasn't long before Jerusalem, after a year's siege, fell to the armies of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, one of the first things that he went and did, like any uh, 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 totalitarian state, he sent in a secret police straight into the capital, and they moved throughout the royal palaces and the nobility. And he took hostage dozens and dozens of quality Jewish youths who were nothing more than mere teenagers to help ensure the best quality people to govern his world and his empire. And certainly it makes logical sense. You invade a country, you take that country over, you take the best brains and minds at a young age, you train them up in the way you want them to be, you send them back in, they know the culture, they know the language, people know them, and they govern the nation just the way you want. Now one of these youths was especially destined for greatness as one who was incredibly wise and insightful. He was godly. He was filled with integrity. He was absolutely uncompromising. And his name was Daniel. Look at verse 3 and 4. Where we see that Daniel describes how King Nebuchadnezzar planned to train the hostages for leadership in an expanding and growing empire. Look at Daniel 1 verse 3 and 4. It says, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without what? Physical defect. What? Handsome. Handsome. Showing aptitude for every kind of learning. Well informed. Quick to understand. Qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them what? The language and the literature of the Babylonians. Wow. Now those verses, just look at them, verse 4, list the priorities that worldly men seek to use to fill positions within government, in business, and in society today, don't they? And that often at a, jo a person's job interview, a person's image is listed over their substance, i.e. their physical attractiveness. It's important. Do they look good? Their intelligence, the way they carry themselves, the gift of the gab. Those things are extremely important, often more so than a person's character. It's not that they do a character investigation. It's how the person looks. It's how they carry themselves. It's how they speak. It's their qualification behind their name. Well, that was certainly the case here with Nebuchadnezzar and Ashpenaz, in that before God, this is why they went and chose these young men. Look, verse 4. But in doing so, they got more than they actually bargained for when they dealt with Daniel and his three friends, didn't they? Now, yes, it's right and it's true that Daniel and his friends would not have been chosen by King Nebuchadnezzar if they didn't have the intellectual ability to actually succeed in their new country of adoption. And they certainly had it. And that point cannot be overemphasized in life. Look at verse 4. It says that there were young men without any physical defect. What? Number one, handsome. Showing what? Aptitude for every kind of learning. Well informed. What? Quick to understand. Qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach you, them, the language of the literature of the Babylonians. And so this group of young men had a superior intellect. They had the capability to make intellectual and wise decisions <coughs> in life. And to discern and to be able to apply truth. They also, verse 4, were quick to understand. In other words, they could take in a lot of facts and, and mentally digest those facts and then put them down on paper or apply them to daily life. In fact, the ancient Hebrew word for understanding there means that they were able to correlate facts and draw logical conclusions. They were very clever young men. There was nothing wrong with their IQ. And so these teenagers had a very superior educational background. If they were students today in one of the schools, then their blazers, they would have colors for science and maths and languages. They were top dog. They were the best of the best. And therefore, as it says there in verse 4, qualified to serve in the king's palace. They weren't just any child. But first of all, they had to have a new education. Look at the end of verse 4. It says of Ashpenaz, the chief of the officials, that he was to teach them. 
the language and the literature of the Babylonians. In other words, verse 4, the decision had been made for them. It came from the higher up. It flowed all the way down. It had been decided that they had to have a new curriculum. One that would take them three years to study through. You can almost imagine a three-year course to do a degree today. They had to study this. Now that word Babylonian, end of verse 4, do you see it? In the Hebrew, it's actually Chaldean. Now originally the Chaldeans were a separate people. They lived in the northern part of Iraq. And they were a highly learned people. They were a very sophisticated people, a very educated people. They were the people that the Magi actually came from to see the birth of Christ. Now, originally the Chaldeans um, uh, 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 were a separate nation, but as the Babylonian Empire expanded, they went and adopted the language and the culture of the, of the Chaldeans. Their science, their literature became absorbed into Babylonian way of life. So that whenever you read in the Bible about the Babylonians, you actually read about the Chaldeans. And when you read about the Chaldeans, you read about the Babylonians. And so when Daniel landed up in the Babylonian court under King Nebuchadnezzar and Ashpenaz, as it says in verse 4, he had to learn the language of the Chaldeans. It was the language of the court, the language of, uh, of the king. It was the language of business and commerce and, and the way life was done at that time. He would also have to, verse 4, learn their uh, literature, which would have gone and included mathematics and astronomy and natural history and architecture and agriculture and biology. He would have had to learn all of these things. For at that time, the Chaldeans were seen as the leading thinkers of the world all the way up to the days of, of Alexander the Great and the Greeks. And so in many ways up to that point, Daniel had to have a new education. Something that could really be seen as a very positive experience in his life. Because there's nothing inherently wrong, nothing wrong in, in gaining a deeper understanding of mathematics or science or languages. The problem is, is that Daniel's re-education didn't end there. Instead, the ultimate goal of the Babylonians was to reprogram Daniel and his friends spiritually, morally, giving them a new ethics in life giving them a brand new value system in life. And that you see, Nebuchadnezzar wanted Daniel and these young men to forget their Jewish heritage. He wanted them to forget that they were the people of the Bible. He didn't want them to acknowledge or remember the God of Israel. He wanted them to set aside the truths of God's word that they had been brought, on, brought up on for the sake of the Babylonian Empire. And so there was a second part to their education, and that is the Babylonians required Daniel to learn the religion of the Chaldeans. The astronomy and the mythology and the magic arts and throwing omens and cutting open the animals and looking at the intestines and trying to predict the future. They wanted them to live a lifestyle like that. It was a very sophisticated brainwashing program. One which literally took a humble Hebrew teenager who had been taken away from his parents, taken away from his country, taken away from his family and friends, totally isolated, and polished them up to become literally a Babylonian witch doctor. That's what they were. The Babylonians also changed Daniel's name to Belteshazzar. Now that might not sound too problematic to you and I as we sit casually this morning and we listen to the word of God. But if you think about it, names are actually very important. They tell people in life who you and I are. They are identity. They are our personality. When you speak about Mark as the minister, you think of Mark as the minister. And sometimes they may even describe your way of life, depending upon your culture and your background. Names are vital. In the Hebrew word, Daniel means God is judge. The name Belteshazzar in the Chaldean means the one who is the disciple of the pagan god Bel. Belteshazzar. Now, as we pick up on the story, we find that Daniel was willing, with God's help, to cooperate only so far with the Babylonian re-education. Look at verse 8. It says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. You say, what's going on here, Mark? 
Well, what was happening is that not only were these young men being educated academically and then being forced as God's people to learn the, uh, 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 the ways of the Babylonians, but they were also being forced to learn pagan religion, pagan magic arts. They were being fed the very best also further from the king's table in terms of his food and his wine. Food that had been dedicated to the offerings and the sacrifices of the false gods in Babylon. And this is why Daniel stood and he drew the line. And as you see, it's one thing for you and I to know about a pagan god. It's one thing for you and I to speak about a Buddha. It's another thing for you and I to get involved in pagan practices. And that sitting down and eating that food would imply participation in our lives. That food's being offered to that God and we sit down and just enjoy it. It's implying participation. And Daniel says, no, I do not worship false gods enough. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. And his law says in Exodus 20 verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or what? Worship them. For I am the Lord your God. And so for Daniel to eat the portion of the royal food would have broken God's law, something that had been inscribed in his own heart ever since he was a child. It would have gone and implied that Daniel was willing in his life to participate in pagan worship feasts before the God of the Bible, who is a jealous God. And so Daniel took a hard line regarding the king's food. And actually, now think about this, that is a basic part of genuine Christian integrity and an uncompromising life for God. In that if you're a genuine follower of Christ in 2020, if the God of the Scripture is your God then for life, you must draw lines of conviction where Scripture draws lines of conviction. So that what you do at home, what you watch on television, what you sit and laugh at in your time of relaxation, the business practices that you get involved in within your own company, or what people want you to get up to at the office in terms of what is acceptable to them in modern business, or in terms of morality, or even what one's government says that one should do, what is politically acceptable today in our country. If the truth of God's word is opposed to the world's wisdom and certain issues, then you must align yourself with God's word and God's word alone. Now, of course, that means on a practical level is that you and I need to know our Bibles, right? We need to know what God's word actually says. And that you and I cannot align our lives with the word of God this, uh, God this morning at home, with our marriages, with our children, with our grandchildren, in our retirement, at work, at university. In fact, over all the issues of daily life, unless we know the word of God, right? How do we apply God's word to our, to our, to our relationships if we don't know what God's word says about it? How do we know, apply God's word to a relationship if we don't know what God's word says about it? How do we apply God's word to our marriages, to our work ethic, unless we know what the word of God actually says? And this is why it is so vital for you and I to take notes and to read the word of God and to study the word of God. And this is the case with Daniel. And that the more that you and I sit back and we analyze his life, we see a life that was driven by the word of God. And because of it, his personal godly integrity is something that comes very powerfully into focus. So that what we are left with is an uncompromising lifestyle that stands in very sharp contrast to the way many believers uh, 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 in, in the modern church live out their Christianity today. And that how many Christians do you know who tend to waver and give ambiguous explanations to non-Christians as to why they abstain from certain activities in daily life. In that they hum and they har and they, they sort of fudge the issue and they hum and they har. It's almost as though at times we are a little bit ashamed that we are Christians in public. Somebody says, oh, I see you've got a Bible. Oh, well, yeah, you know. We sort of hide it away. 
in that we don't often take a stand for God's word as we actually should be taking a stand for the word of God. But not Daniel. Not Daniel. And that when we look for God, that young man, we find a love for God that was totally unashamed. He loved God. He proclaimed God as his own. And he took that stand for God as he lived life, no matter how hard and difficult it was for him. He stood with unashamed boldness. Wow. He knew what the word of God actually said. He knew what God expected of him in daily life. And he didn't take the easy way out. Instead, he went straight for the heart of the issue in life itself. Look at verse 8 with me. It says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official, Ashpenaz, for permission not to defile himself this way. Wow. Just try and imagine the scene. Daniel is in the royal palace. He's about 14 years of age. He had lost his parents. He was alone. He was a prisoner across 600 miles away from Israel through one of the toughest deserts in the world. You travel into the Saudi desert, it's hot and it's miles of stones and scorpions. The most dangerous deserts. The king who ruled the palace is known for his explosive, fiery temper. He didn't like you, he blew your house up literally. He knocked it down and he had you executed. And then an order is given by the king. And Daniel turns around to the jailer and essentially he challenges the command of the king. But do you know that unashamed boldness is an inevitable trait <coughs> of an uncompromising godly life. If you live a godly life, you will have an unashamed boldness for God before the world. You say, but Mark, when I look at what Daniel says here, he's actually very polite. <coughs> Excuse me. And voicing his protest against the dude. And then he simply turns around to Ashpenaz and he says, at the end of verse 8, Sir, may I have permission not to defile myself with the food and the wine? May I have permission? That's pretty polite, don't you think? No, not really. And that the word defiled in the, in the Middle Eastern mind from the Hebrew means an abomination to the Lord. It means contamination. It means adulterated. It means polluted. It means corrupt. And that is what he is calling, verse 4, the very best of the king's food. He calls the king's food corrupt, polluted, adulterated, and contaminated food that is an abomination to God. That's what the Hebrew says. That's the Middle Eastern mind. Daniel doesn't mince his words, does he? It's actually quite offensive. And then imagine somebody, men, coming into your house and saying that about your wife's cooking. I wonder how many ladies here would be happy if they invited a guest for dinner, he sat down at the dinner table, and he said that about your dinner. Daniel didn't mince his words. Imagine the lady standing there and they say, your food is contaminated, it's adulterated, and it's an abomination to God. And you spend all the evening cooking it. And do you know why? Well, because the Hebrew indicates Daniel's desire to actually elaborate on why the royal food was a defilement to him personally. To the point here that the Hebrew indicates that he turned to Ashpenaz and he actually explained the basis of God's Old Testament food laws. And in doing so, he gave Ashpenaz some carefully chosen words about the sin of paganism in his own life. There's a far deeper meaning than our English Bibles bring out. And it makes sense, doesn't it? And that he didn't just turn around to verse 8 to Ashpenaz and say, listen, I don't want to eat your food. Ashpenaz would have turned around and said, why? Why don't you want to eat the food? And that is what the Hebrew brings out. He actually explained to Ashpenaz. There was an unashamed boldness for God. Which means that he was thoroughly transparent regarding his stand on the issues of right and wrong in his life. Now obviously we need to be wise in how we speak to others concerning the issues of right and wrong. We need to speak up, but we've got to be wise in how you handle it. Daniel spoke boldly in the context of his world and within his culture. Bold for Jesus Christ. But remember, wisely. Wisely. 
Turn with me to Proverbs 29.25. Proverbs 29.25. <clears throat> Just after Psalms. Proverbs 29.25. It says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. Isn't that true? And that how many of us as Christians allow ourselves to be intimidated by the opinions of others? In that we are scared of what others may think of us at work and our stand for Christianity and our church going. We're scared of what others may say in terms of our friends or our family. If we take a Christian stand over what is right, those snide comments, oh, you see, he's got religion. He's all religious suddenly. No, no, no. He's either standing by God's word or not. We've got a higher calling for 2020. When you walk into your work environment, you stand there as an ambassador of Christ with a higher calling for 2020. When you stand as a father in your home, or a mother in your home, or a grandparent in your, with your grandchildren in your home, you have a higher calling from God for your own life. Don't allow yourself to fall short of God's standards and giving God glory and life as the Holy Spirit has inscribed it upon your own heart because of fear of what others will say and what others will do and the loss of friendships. For to fear man means to be led into wrongdoing. Honor God who rules all things. Think of Abraham in Genesis 12, 13. Because of his fear of man, he denied his wife. Not once, but twice. And he nearly lost her once to Pharaoh and then to Abimelech. Think of Peter. Because of his fear of man, he denied Jesus. Three times he denied Jesus. In Proverbs chapter 29, 45, it further says this. That he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. He who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. God exalts those in life who turn and they put their entire confidence in him. And this is what the, bio, the, the people of God have been noted for throughout the pages of Scripture. Lives of unashamed boldness as they trust in God in their daily lives. Look at King David. Turn with me to Psalm 40. Psalm 40 verse 9. Don't you find this exciting? We need to take that stand for Christ. We've got to be different people. Psalm 40, look at verse 9. He said, I proclaim righteousness, that's God's ways, what's pleasing to God, in the great assembly of people. I do not seal my lips as you know, O Lord. I do not hide your righteousness, your holiness in my heart. I speak out what? Your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly of people. Wow. Or think of the prophet Elijah, who in boldness dared to stand alone against the 450 false prophets of Baal and the 400 false prophets of Ashtoreth and an entire nation who had gone and rejected the ways of the Lord in Israel and boldly speak out and challenge the heresy and the idol worship of his own day. Elijah's trust in God like Daniel made him strong and it made him bold to oppose the majority who were wrong. And Elijah changed history that day for God's name on Mount Carmel by exposing falsehood and lies about God and turning Israel as a nation right back to the Lord. And you know it's no different in the New Testament. And that if we sit back this morning and we think of the great apostle Paul Every single time he was put under pressure for the gospel, he stood up and he proclaimed Christ. He spoke about Jesus. So much so that in Philippians 1.27, he said this to the church of, the Corinth, uh, of Christians in the city of Philippi. In fact, they just told me, you want to look at this. Philippians 1, look at verse 27. Philippians 1.27. Really exciting. Look at Philippians 1.27. Now think of your own life here. He says in verse 27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened, see that? 
in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Wow. Later he turned and he wrote uh, to the Christian man Timothy, and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And there are so many who have stood in their generations for God. What about the early Christians in the early church who risked everything, their lives, their jobs, their careers, for godliness and the, and the truth of Christ? All as they refused to compromise their obedience for the love of God and what was right in a godless world. You've only got to go home and read Acts chapter 4 verse 19 onwards. How Christians were taken and thrown to the gladiators. They were thrown into the arenas. They were torn apart. They were sewn up in the skins of animals and ripped apart by dogs. They were set on fire in Nero's gardens. And as a result, they suffered persecution. They were thrown and, and, and fed to lions. And yet their faith and their Christian boldness and integrity for God remained steadfast and it was strong. They persevered in every breath for the Jesus that they loved. And God exalted them, Proverbs 29, 25. And there are so many examples of an overcoming faith, such as Esther and Job, who stood up and they spoke for what was right, who stood against godlessness of their time. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, 32, it says, What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions and quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Christians who stood in their day uncompromising lives and invariably set standards that exceeded the norm. They won't, they won't settle for the status quo in the world as the world sees it for 2020. It doesn't matter how government sees it. It doesn't matter how the ethics of the country see it. It doesn't matter what people see it. You stand for Christ in 2020. Instead, they will live for Christ obediently, speak for Christ with boldness, and move for God with victory. Victory. Let's turn back to Daniel as we come to Christ. If Daniel had not stood firm at this point, think about this, could he possibly have stood firm later in Daniel 5 when he stood in the lion's den? If his three companions had not stood for the Lord at this point, and they had compromised in their early life, could they have stood for God later when they faced a fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3? It is because they honored God in small things that they were able to honor God when bigger issues were at stake. People who fall into serious sins only do so because they have tolerated smaller ones. Smaller ones. I wonder, in closing, are you somebody here today who is tolerating a small sin in your life? Smudging it. Are you perhaps compromising God's standards in your thought life, in your attitudes, your tempers, your morality, and you know it? Are you compromising in a relationship? When it comes to Daniel, the immediate outcome of this courageous and spirited action is recorded for us in verse 11. Look at verse 11, Daniel chapter 1, if you've got that. It, still, it says, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test the servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier, better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guards took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Daniel and his friends put God before every consideration and God honored them. 
And he stirred up in their lives gifts they had never ever dreamed that they possibly had in their lives. Look at verse 17. To these four young men who God gave knowledge and understanding. God gave it. It's not that they sat at their desk studying all night by their desk lamp and so on. God gave them a knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand what visions and dreams of all kinds. Wow. In terms of integrity, none of us can have an influence for the Lord if we're unwilling to stand and be counted for Him over the very small things of daily life. For it is impossible to be faithful in much without first being faithful in very little. In very little. Question. What would you say is the very central lesson of Daniel? What would you say is the central lesson in, in, in Daniel's life? Are you ready for it? 1 Samuel 2.30 the Lord declares, those who honor me, I shall honor, declares the Lord. Those who honor me, for their in their life, in 2020, I will honor, says the Lord. <coughs> Let's pray. Excuse me. Perhaps the Lord has spoken into your heart this morning. Those who stand in the very small things of life for God are able to stand no matter the difficulty in the bigger things of life. The Lord declares, those who honor me, I shall honor, declares the Lord. I want you to speak to the Lord about your life. Taking that bold and victorious stand for Jesus Christ this year. Lord, we know that we are to take that stand in our marriages lies with us, in our homes, in our relationships, in our morality, in our thoughts, in our words, in our tempers, in our temperaments, in our deeds, our friendships. We are to take that stand. We know what your word says. And Lord, we see with Daniel how you honoured Daniel. You gave him insight for his work and his, and his ministry before you far beyond anything they'd ever seen. Gifts and abilities. How we need your blessing for 2020. In our companies, in our marriages, our, our spouses, with our children, our finances, our lives. How we want to stand before you one day and hear those coveted words, well done, good and faithful servant. And to know that we have lived to honor you, to not stand before you one day and to be ashamed, but to live to the glory of Christ. Lord, help us to take that stand. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult, may we discipline ourselves. May we stand up boldly for Jesus Christ. May we walk with conviction, courageously, and with great boldness. And may we do it wisely, for Jesus' sake. God's people say, Amen.